Welcome to another session of the MedTech Lounge. For today's topic, we will be talking about a bioethical issue where it has been a subject of a heated debate for the longest time now. This topic is also regarded as one of the most crucial issues to be discussed. So let us now listen to the many facts, fallacies, views, and even opinions considering our bioethical issue for today, and that is abortion. Abortion is a very painful topic for women and men who find themselves facing the moral dilemma of whether or not to terminate a pregnancy. As what I have said, it's one of the most polarizing moral issues. And most people are on one side or the other. Very few are still undecided. Let us define abortion. This one class is the termination of a pregnancy by the removal or expulsion from the uterus of a fetus or an embryo resulting in or caused by its death. An abortion can occur spontaneously due to complications during pregnancy or can be induced in humans and other species. In the context of human pregnancies, an abortion induced to preserve the health of the gravida, so when you say gravida, that's the pregnant female, is termed a therapeutic abortion. While an abortion induced for any other reason is termed as an elective abortion. The term abortion most commonly refers to the induced abortion of a human pregnancy, while spontaneous abortions are usually termed miscarriages. Worldwide, there are actually estimated 42 million abortions to take place annually, with 22 million of this occurring safely and the other 20 million unsafely. While maternal mortality seldom results from safe abortions, unsafe abortions result in 70,000 deaths and 5 million disabilities per year. One of the main determinants of the availability of safe abortions is the legality of this procedure. 40% of the world's women are able to access therapeutic and even elective abortions within gestational limits. The frequency of abortions is, however, similar whether or not access is restricted. You know what? Um, abortion has a long history and has been induced by various methods, including herbal abortifacients, can also be the use of sharpened tools or physical trauma and other traditional methods. Contemporary medicine utilizes medications and surgical procedures to induce abortion. Abortions are legal throughout much of the world, but still, laws may vary. There are actually 61 countries, including much of Europe, that allow abortions without any restrictions. 26 countries ban abortions altogether with no exceptions, and the remaining countries allow abortions with restrictions, such as maybe to save the mother's life or protect the mother's health. In the United States, abortion is already legal during the first and second trimesters of pregnancy. So, in that country, most abortions are done during the first trimester of the pregnancy. While in our country, the Philippines, we have one of the most restrictive abortion policies in the world. So, we criminalize abortion with no exceptions. The church and the government have constantly clashed regarding the ethical issue of whether to legalize this procedure or not. There are two ways of carrying out this procedure, namely by taking a pill or undergoing a surgical procedure. 
Medication abortion, also known as the abortion pill, consists of using two different medicines called mefepristone and misoprostol to end a pregnancy. This medicine causes cramping and bleeding to empty your uterus. It's kind of like having a very heavy and crampy period, and the process is very similar to an early miscarriage. The taking of pills to prevent pregnancy is the most popular method used here in the Philippines because aside from it is cheap, it is also a non-invasive procedure. I will show you a video from njem.org that explains why a pregnant woman who is planning to have an abortion takes both mefeprestone and misoprostol. A synthetic prostaglandin analog and mifepristone, a progesterone and glucocorticoid receptor antagonist that primes the uterus and cervix for prostaglandin activity, can be used in the medical management of early pregnancy loss. Misoprostol alone has a high failure rate in women with a closed cervical os, leading 15 to 40 percent of women to require a second misoprostol dose or uterine aspiration of the gestational sac. The efficacy and safety of misoprostol and mifepristone combination therapy in early pregnancy loss remains unclear. In this randomized clinical trial of 300 women with non-viable intrauterine pregnancy, patients received pretreatment with 200 milligrams of mifepristone approximately 24 hours before receiving 800 micrograms of misoprostol vaginally, or received misoprostol alone. Patients with a persistent gestational sac at initial follow-up, 24 hours to 4 days after misoprostol use, could receive additional treatment. The primary outcome, treatment success, was defined as gestational sac expulsion by initial follow-up and no additional interventions within 30 days. The rate of treatment success was 83.8% among women who received mefepristone pretreatment at a median follow-up of two days, and 67.1% among women who received misoprostol alone at a median follow-up of 2.6 days. 30 days after randomization, the rate of uterine aspiration following mifepristone and misoprostol treatment was 8.8% as compared with 23.5% after misoprostol alone. There was no significant difference between the two treatment groups in rates of bleeding that resulted in blood transfusion. The authors conclude that mifepristone administration before misoprostol treatment resulted in a significantly higher rate of treatment success in early pregnancy loss. The other technique is the surgical procedure or otherwise known as the in-clinic abortion. This involves the mechanical removal of the fetus in the womb through a minor operation. It works by using suction to empty your uterus. How late you can get an abortion depends on the laws in which country you belong and what doctor, abortion clinic, or Planned Parenthood Health Center you go to. It may be harder to find a doctor or nurse or any healthcare professional who will do an abortion after the 12th week of pregnancy. The next following videos that I'm going to show you comes from live action by Dr. Anthony Levitino. Trigger warning. Some viewers, students, and even medical professionals may find the following videos very disturbing so viewer discretion is advised. Levitino, I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. Today I'm going to describe a first trimester surgical abortion called suction DNC, dilatation and curatage. This is the most frequently performed abortion and is used typically from five to 13 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a speculum like this. This is placed inside the vagina and opened using this screw on the side, allowing the abortionist to see the cervix, the entrance to the uterus. The cervix acts as a gate that stays closed for the duration of pregnancy, protecting the baby until it is ready for birth. The abortionist uses a series of metal rods called dilators, like these, which increase in thickness and inserts them into the cervix to dilate it, gaining access to the inside of the uterus where the baby resides. If the baby has a heartbeat, fingers, toes, arms, and legs, but its bones are still weak and fragile. The abortionist takes a suction catheter like this one. This is a 14 French suction catheter. It's clear plastic, about nine inches long, and it has a hole through the center. It is inserted through the cervix into the uterus. The suction machine is then turned on with a force 10 to 20 times more powerful than your household vacuum cleaner. The baby is rapidly torn apart by the force of the suction and squeezed through this tubing down into the suction machine. 
followed by the placenta. Though the uterus is mostly emptied at this point, one of the risks of a suction DNC is incomplete abortion. Essentially, pieces of the baby or placenta left behind. This can lead to infection or bleeding. In an attempt to prevent this, the abortionist uses a curette to scrape a lining of the uterus. The curette is basically a long-handled curved blade. Once the uterus is empty, the speculum is removed and the abortion is complete. The risks of suction DNC include perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix, potentially damaging intestine, bladder, and nearby blood vessels, hemorrhage, infection, and in rare instances, even death. Future pregnancies are also at a greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. My name is Dr. Anthony Levitino. I'm a practicing obstetrician gynecologist, and I've performed over 1,200 abortions. Today, I'm going to describe a second trimester surgical abortion called dilatation and evacuation, or D&E. A D&E is performed between 13 and 24 weeks of pregnancy. After administering anesthesia, the abortionist uses a weighted speculum, like this one, that opens the vagina widely. Because second trimester babies are so large, this greater access facilitates a late-term abortion. Late-term abortion requires that the cervix be prepared 24 to 48 hours in advance with laminaria. Laminaria is a type of sterilized seaweed that absorbs water over 8 to 12 hours and swells to several times its original diameter. Once removed, metal dilators can be used to further open the cervix as needed. Once the cervix has been stretched open, the suction tube is placed inside. A baby at 20 weeks gestation is as big as the length of my hand from head to rump, not counting the legs. The suction machine is turned on, and pale yellow amniotic fluid surrounding the baby is suctioned out through the catheters. With babies this big, they don't fit through catheters this size. The baby's bones and skull are too strong to be torn apart by suction alone. This is a sofa clamp. A sofa clamp is made of stainless steel. It's about 13 inches long. The business end is about two and a half inches long and a half inch wide, and there are rows of sharp teeth. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or a leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the baby's body. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed, along with the intestines, the spine, and the heart and lungs. Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head, which is about the size of a large plum at 20 weeks. The head is grasped and crushed. The abortionist knows he has crushed the skull when a white substance comes out of the cervix. This was the baby's brains. The abortionist then removes skull pieces. He removes the placenta and any leftover parts of the baby with a curette, scraping the lining of the uterus for any remaining tissue. The abortionist then collects the baby parts and reassembles them to make sure that there are two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. Once all the parts have been accounted for, the abortion is complete. For the woman, this procedure carries a significant risk of major complications, including perforation or laceration of the uterus or cervix with possible damage to the bowel, bladder, and other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur, which can even lead to death. Future pregnancies are also at greater risk for loss or premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix. As I mentioned at the beginning, I'm Dr. Anthony Levitino, and in the early part of my career as an OBGYN, I performed over 1,200 abortions. One day, after completing one of those abortions, I looked at the remains of a pre-born child whose life I had ended, and all I could see was someone's son or daughter. I came to realize that killing a baby at any stage of pregnancy for any reason is wrong. I want you to know today, no matter where you're at or what you've done, you can change. Make a decision today to protect the preborn. In the United States, 3 out of 10 women have an abortion by the time they are 45 years old. In some countries, abortion is a legal medical procedure which can be performed if the patient meets certain qualifications. In the United Kingdom, the Abortion Act of 1967 covers England, Scotland, and Wales. In the United States, a pregnant woman under 18 may be required by the state to get permission from her parents, either one or both of the parents, for the abortion. In some states, a judge can excuse a pregnant woman seeking abortion from this requirement. Although considered as a medical procedure, abortion poses many complications. Let's also talk about the legalization of abortion in the Philippines. During the year 1998, it was the term of former President Joseph Estrada 
the members of the House of Representatives were engaged in a hot debate on whether to legalize abortion procedures in the country for special circumstances. The introduction of the bill immediately sparked a persistent controversy over legalizing abortion. The Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines, through its spokesperson Pedro Quitorio, aired dismay at the introduction of the bill, and since then, many pro-life groups have united and rallied against the bill. Groups that are against the abortion bill strongly support other government programs such as family planning through contraceptive use instead of endorsing abortion. Let's talk about the facts on abortion in the Philippines. I got this from the Center for Reproductive Rights and you may also check this out if you want to learn more about the criminalization and a general ban on abortion. As we all know, for over a century, abortion has been criminalized in the Philippines. The criminal provisions on abortion do not contain any exceptions allowing abortion, including to save the life of the pregnant woman or to protect her health. Abortion was criminalized through the Penal Code of 1870 under Spanish colonial rule, and the criminal provisions were incorporated into the Revised Penal Code passed in 1930 under United States occupation of the Philippines. Also, the famous Article 2 of the 1987 Philippine Constitution says, in part, Section 12, to be specific, it states that the state recognizes the sanctity of family life and shall protect and strengthen the family as a basic autonomous social institution. It shall equally protect the life of the mother and the life of the unborn from conception. The act, as what I have been saying, is criminalized by Philippine law. Articles 256, 258, and 259 of the Revised Penal Code of the Philippines mandate imprisonment for women who undergo abortion as well as for any person who assists in the procedure. Article 258 further imposes a higher prison term on the woman or her parents if the abortion is undertaken, especially in order to conceal the woman's dishonor. There is no law in the Philippines that expressly authorizes abortions in order to save the woman's life. And the general provisions which do penalize abortion make no qualifications if the woman's life is endangered. It may be argued that an abortion to save the mother's life could be classified as a justifying circumstance, but that would bar criminal prosecution under the revised penal code. However, this has yet to be adjudicated by the Philippine Supreme Court. Proposals also to liberalize Philippine abortion laws have been opposed by the Catholic Church and this opposition has considerable influence in the predominantly Catholic country that we have. However, the constitutionality of abortion restrictions has yet to be challenged before the Philippine Supreme Court. Before judging a person, let's first listen to opinions of women who have undergone or are contemplating an abortion. There are actually several reasons why women in the Philippines choose to have an abortion rather than to continue the life they carry in their womb. An example given in the book, on April 21, 2009, a report presented some cases of women who opted for abortion. One reason is the incapacity to take care of the baby due to poverty. One case involves a woman becoming pregnant with her seventh child. So this woman has multiple children. 
the family earns roughly 200 pesos a day. So imagine that class. And they thought of maybe having another child will make the situation much worse. So what can you say? But remember, never judge a person. Another story tells of a certain woman who was raped and got pregnant. And due to embarrassment, this woman decided to purchase Cytotec. So aside from Mephepristone and Misoprostol, there is also a famous abortion drug that is currently used in the Philippines, and that's Cytotec. Cytotechlas is a drug that prevents gastric ulcer and this also has an abortive effect by softening the cervix and inducing labor. Another case involves the unwanted pregnancy of minors who are sexually active at an early age. Though despite the reasons given, under the revised penal code of 1930, a woman who undergoes abortion and anyone assisting in the process can face imprisonment. A licensed professional who performs an abortion gets a failed term plus the revocation of his or her license. As bad as it may sound, in some medical cases, abortion may be carried out to save the life of a mother. In the United Kingdom, the Abortion Act of 1967 may permit abortion in these following cases. Number one, the pregnancy involves a greater risk to the mother's life than ending the pregnancy. An example of this is an ectopic pregnancy. This type of pregnancy class happens when a fertilized egg implants itself outside of the womb. Usually, this is found in either of the fallopian tubes. The fallopian tube, if you can remember, these are the tubes connecting the ovaries to the womb. So this means if an egg gets stuck in them, it won't develop into a baby and your health may be at risk if the pregnancy continues. There's a greater chance that if this fertilized egg grows in the fallopian tubes, your tubes might burst. Another instance where abortion is allowed is when the pregnancy involves a greater risk of injury to the woman's physical or mental health than ending the pregnancy. Another example of this could be herniated discs or slip disc while pregnant. So it was reported that pregnant women feels very painful whenever this happens. Interestingly enough, this condition can be common in pregnant women due to the expected weight gain and increased pressure on the spine. But there are also some cases that women will not experience symptoms of a herniated disc, nor will they know one exists during their time of pregnancy. But in very rare cases, class, pregnant women can have a serious injury such as um, slip disc. And in this case, you might need a surgery. Another instance where abortion is allowed in the UK is when the pregnancy involves a greater risk to the physical or mental health of any of the woman's existing children. And lastly... There is a significant risk that the baby will be born with a serious physical or mental disability. This can be detected as early as the first trimester of screening. This is the reason why class prenatal testing is really very important so that um, the mother or the soon-to-be parents can have an idea of what is happening with the baby, whether the baby has or is to be checked for birth defects or other problems this can also save both the mother and the baby so it's important to talk to your doctor about any concerns during prenatal testing 
after hearing the different opinions of women who are contemplating with an abortion or the instances why UK will allow abortion. Let's also talk about the different risks associated with abortion. Aside from the mere fact that this is punishable by law, abortion has many ill effects on a woman's body. The effects may vary from physical, emotional, and psychological effects to a combination of all of these. The next following slides will show us the recorded effects of abortion on a woman. The very first risk that we'll be talking about is the readily observable risk, and that is physical. According to a study, most physical complications from abortion develop as a result of the incomplete evacuation of the uterus. There can also be infection or injury from using those instruments during the procedure. Excessive bleeding is the most common form of risk after abortion and may be due to a torn cervix or punctured uterus. Infection may be caused by the introduction of bacteria contaminated instrument used during the operation. Pelvic inflammatory disease is the most common infection to occur in women who have undergone abortion. Incompetent cervix is caused by forcibly opening the cervix in an abortion procedure. Multiple abortions may weaken the cervix. And moreover, women who have undergone abortion increase the risk of becoming sterile in the future. In another study, women who have experienced abortion have a much higher risk of developing long-term clinical depression compared with non-abortive women. Among these emotional risks are depression and anxiety, can lead to substance abuse, or making use of drugs as an escape, relationship and sexual difficulties, smoking, suicide, and post-abortion stress syndrome. After hearing all the legal and ethical considerations regarding abortion, it will still all boil down and revolve around the norms and values within the family. Some parents may not be in favor of abortion due to the belief of bad karma, while other parents allow abortion without considering the provisions of the Penal Code of the Philippines. So, after careful studying regarding this topic, aside from knowing the facts and legalities, I also wanted to listen to the different opinions and point of views from different people that I know. And basing from there, I have come to let them choose between pro-life or pro-choice. So kindly take this time to read and reflect on the different takes on the respondents regarding abortion.
How about you? Are you pro-life or pro-choice? Take time to reflect on this and let me hear what is your take regarding this topic. I will wait for your answers in the comment section of this video. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you make good choices and you've learned something new from me today. Keep safe and God bless us all.